Mickey Hart here. You're listening to the GAR Football Show. The GAR Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet. It took me a long time to get here. Both players have, have spoken with each other and, uh, and they regret what happened. They've had a frank discussion with each other and they're, they're both of them are keen to, to now focus on getting back to their county jerseys. But these fellas, they get such a f***ing shit shock next Saturday evening that we'll put them back in their f***ing houses for f***ing 10 years. All right, so the final round of football, lads. There's loads of stuff going on. Dublin have nothing to play for in Division 1. Isn't it great? They're the only team. <laughs> Armagh are the only team in Division 2 who have nothing to play for. Um, Division 3, Sligo are the only team who have nothing to play for, except for a little bit of pride because they haven't won a game. So it's all kicking off. Um, unfortunately for the CCCC, they couldn't refix the Loud West Mead match, which was supposed to be played last week. Obviously, Claire and Mead got, got refixed to the following day. Very harsh on players to ask them to if they had plans for the bank holiday weekend. But anyways, they did. West Mead had some issues with uh, some team members being guards and being um, due to work on St. Patrick's Day. And Loud had some issues as well. So they couldn't refix that. So the CCCC, instead of playing it maybe Wednesday night, have 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 decided to go ahead with the final round of games and pray <laughs> that it works in their favour. Because it, could, cause there, it won't work in their favour. Too many different results. Like if Leash beat Carlo, that game's going to have to be played, I'm pretty sure. And if Westmead... Um, if Westmead beat Longford you know it has to, the, the problem is that Loud and Westmead both have chances of making Division yeah. 3 final so the chances of the GA getting what the CCCC saying let's hope this works out now it could I, I don't think it will Probably like the won't. Division 3 final will be on into the April for months which is it will be embarrassing because last year obviously they wrote off a full round because they could I don't yeah. think they'll get to write off this Westmead Loud game. Definitely not. And um, of all the games, probably in Division Three, that they wanted to be cancelled last weekend, that was the that was the one they didn't yeah. want to be cancelled. Mm. And uh, look, it's going to be a massive headache from now in the next couple of weeks. It definitely is. So we've Gary Sice coming up on the show. Um, we'll go through loads of permutations in Part Three and look ahead to one or two of the games. Um, but we'll do that in that section. Gary Sice is coming up in Part Two, and obviously we eulogised about Cara Finn. Um, I did the interview with Gary yesterday. I didn't actually realise he started out as a cornerback. Isn't that incredible? Now, so obviously then he's a wing back is my first memory of him. Then he's a working wing forward for Galway. He's a working wing forward for Curra Finn, but goes on the freeze. And now he's 34. He's given more of an advanced role. So he's corner forward, maybe out in front of the, the two man full forward line or three man full forward line. So he's, he's, he, the responsibility for tracking back has been given to poor yeah. Michal Lundy <laughs> and to Leonard, the other wing forward. And he's got this playmaking role. So for a fella who started out as a corner back, um, wing back, He's taken to this playmaking role like a like a duck to water, Maddie. Like he gives beautiful ball into the forward line. I know. Look, he's a quality footballer, and as long as I can remember him playing, he's been the very same thing. He's a, a guy that, to me, always seemed to have wanted to get his head up and play, and, and particularly kick the ball. And he seems to kick the ball an awful lot. And you know, whether he was corner back or goalkeeper, you're going to have want to have a guy like that in your team. Um, yeah. And he, he he is a good playmaker. You know, he's a kind of a, a party Joyce kind of a centre forward yeah. Kieran McDonald he's trying to get the ball to the full forward line as quick as possible and even starting to play off it now and you know the, the goal that he scored the other day um, is just something extra that I wouldn't even say that he's added but something extra that he's doing now along with his free taking and you know just he goes about his business really quietly but by Jesus it's very very effective the, the beauty of having him there in that role the playmaking role and loves to kick it means that encourages the lads inside to make great runs because yeah. they know they're going to get uh they're going to get picked out. And then the way they can, the Farahers and Ian Burt, the way they can just throw it around amongst each other. It's just a beautiful thing. But their movement wouldn't be as good unless they had a fella who they knew for sure. Yeah. For sure when he gets this ball, nine times out of ten, he's going to turn and give it into us. Their movement is crazy then because they know that it's going to come. Yeah, and they know when he's running for the ball, he's probably going to win it as well. He's, such, he's still such a good ball winner. Like and when I watch him, I it's actually... It's a hardy bit of stuff too. Yeah, like and it's, it's hard to get around him since he's a big, strong back, like, you know, so he wins it and then they're already moving even before he's turned because um, they know when he turns he's looking up straight away and there was a couple of times in the finals outside of the boot just sort of into the space for a boy yeah. to run on there and it's floating up for them and it's actually hard to imagine him playing any other position now because he's so good at that and he's just his left foot is so natural like one of the best in Ireland yeah no it definitely is so Cara Finn it, the Don't Foul Twitter account had who does good stats did um, some analysis on Cara Finn's first half so did 128 passes 
Only four of those passes out of 128 were went astray. 3% went to led to turnovers. Um, 35% of passes were kicked. Um, and just the one ball turned over in the tackle. That's incredible stats. Like, I mean, I don't know what your stats were like with Wexford when you were in there with your Maddie, but I wouldn't think you were getting them back in at halftime. That, like, I mean, one ball turned over in the tackle. Three percent of of passes turned over. No, it's that's a, so almost perfection in an all around. It's as, clo- as close as you can get in in any game. If you don't yeah. in a in a training session, you'd be you'd be very impressed with it. But um, look, I think it's more of a, a reflection on them rather than Doctor Crokes. In fairness, you know they're, they're they're a fantastic football team, and you know it's seen been discussed of what what league division would they play in, and to be well capable of playing the national league, probably in in a fairly decent in a fairly decent division where do you well. think they'd be they'd be mid-table division 3 I think would they or they op- at, at, they'd be knocking least, on the division 3 the, door absolutely I think they certainly would um, you know just look at our forward line alone there's county teams would give their right arm to have that forward line yeah. um, you know and then big die work in the middle of the field you know it was an absolute animal playing yeah. all in our football um, I think absolutely mid-table if not a bit higher in division 3 yeah maybe they'd be knocking on the door as long as they didn't get promotion ahead of Leash I, would, I wouldn't <laughs> be too bad um, so Paddy Andrews jaw is broken lads that's the terrible news coming out of this week probably not all that surprising news the way he the way he Jeez, was hit yeah. the way he went down knocked out just horrific we were talking about this Matty on um, on Monday um, I'm just wondering what your take on it is like I mean there's no way Morgan went to break his jaw. Morgan went to take him out. I don't think Morgan went to take him out by hitting him in the jaw. Morgan went to blindside him with a good rattle. And if he went off injured, so be it. That's like, I mean, we were saying any player, if they had an opportunity to legally take a man out and make him have to leave the field, you would take that opportunity, wouldn't you? I think a lot of a lot of lads would in fairness. And, you know, I, I'd be very surprised if any player on the field ever went to, to do a guy like that or to deliberately hurt someone. But look at the the way uh, Niall Morgan is obviously taller than Paddy Andrews and, you know, his shoulder is going to be above above Paddy's. But yeah, and Paddy it, was bending down, I think. He as was, well, and slightly. kind of on the turn a small bit as well and, and kind of, as you say, blindsided him. Um, look, it didn't look great, but you'd really like to think that it certainly wasn't deliberate. But, Absolutely, going into to really, you know, if you can get a chance to hit a guy a really good, a really good belt, you're going to do it. I know, fairly, yeah. you're you're not. Go- he wasn't going in with a flying elbow or anything like that, but yeah. it just it didn't look good. But again, I I don't think I wouldn't like to think it was deliberate. No, definitely not. But like I mean, you've obviously had balls come over your head where you're turning around, and it would cross your mind sometimes. <laughs> I'm wide open here yeah. and sometimes you can get it and other times you're like thank God <laughs> like but yeah. you do there are balls and like th- this is obviously the test some lads are called windy you see some lads where they'll pause when that happens and that's a big test of a player as well and like I mean you just have to go like uh, you know you might think afterwards geez I was under pressure there or I don't know where the ball is and then afterwards you think Jesus that was kind of wide open but you simply have to go for the ball but absolutely the opposition can nail you in that position. And often with centre-backs you hear down through the years, you had a chance to nail him there and you never did it. I want to see him limping off the field. Like, we've all heard these, like, yeah. you're, you're, that that's promoted within the game, you know? Yeah, look, when you're coaching, I think as well, you're, you're always trying to encourage fellas to take the ball, if possible, facing forward or facing the tackle, because I'd always be saying to young, fe- young fellas, try and get your timing right. If you're kind of turning sideways or backwards facing the ball to turn back in, the first thing is going to happen to you is a big fella's going to come in and bang. Yeah. And I'm not saying you do, it, you do it deliberately, I'm saying, but if the chance is there, they're probably going to do it to you. Why can't you do it to them? And it, look, it's fair. It's on the ball, it's shoulder to shoulder. But um, you know, there is the bo- there's hundreds of times it's happened that. But you f- kind of feel you have to go for the ball because like you just can't pull out. But again, the opportunity there is for the opposition to come and nail you. That's when you're nailed. But that's just part of the game. But like I mean, um, Niall said on Twitter, uh, and, uh, he was just replying to fellas. Obviously, Twitter is Twitter, and he's probably getting attacked by a yeah. few uh, fairly kind of you know. Uh, biased uh, Dublin fans maybe and he says I'm obviously gutted for Paddy a great player and a great person too he says and no matter what um, any person says I've never before and never will go out to harm another player end of story I believe him I don't think yeah. there's any reason not to believe him it's, unfo- it's unfortunate but again we go back to it it was a, de- it was a guaranteed red card unfortunately yeah. and I see some people talking about intent and everything and we want to get like Gary Lineker talking about contact and intent contact. intent is irrelevant Intent is irrelevant. So if you go out to try and tackle a fella and you, you, hit, you, him the face. you hit him in the face or you mm. clothesline him, your intent was to tackle the ball, but you still dangerously clothesline him yeah. and you get a red card. Intent. When are we going to have these conversations surrounding intent? Yeah. And I don't... I, well, it's, it's not a natural thing either. Like, have you ever seen someone really shoulder someone in the jaw? Like, how hard would that be to do, to, to mean to do that? Line up somebody's jaw from 20 yards away and... 
and yeah. hit him with the shoulder. Like if he was trying to do that, like I think Maddie said, like he would lift your arm if you if you were actually trying to connect with him, you would hit him with an elbow. Yeah. Like, but it, he was trying to just throw his body into his, and unfortunately, that's where it connected. Yeah. It was badly timed. Instead of hitting him in the shoulder, he came across him that bit too too fast and uh, got him in jail. A lot of people are reading a lot into this Dublin thing, and we tried not to on Monday because, like, I mean, Christ, it's only the league, and I don't know. We did speculate that five in a row could potentially weigh them down. or It's an extra pressure for them. There's no doubt about this. But I saw a headline on the RT website. Is there something seriously wrong with the dub? Uh, I was just like, no, there's not <laughs> something seriously wrong with the dub. Like people, they read so much into this. Like, I mean, it's not, this is not, it's not panic stations for Dublin by any means. It was a bad performance. It's probably because we're just not used to seeing Dublin be so sloppy. Um, now look, I think we're reading too much into a lot of, of league performances, good and bad, particularly by the Division 1 teams, because uh, I've already said that, you know, a Division 1 team, the likes of a Dublin or Mayo, when it comes to it, they can always produce big performances and they can and they ca- carry the same, you know, like this time last week we would have been sitting here talking about Kerry, you know, they're going to coast through the league, win the seven league games and probably yeah. win the final and now all of a sudden after one defeat minus about six or seven players in bad conditions, again, Mayo team who were who played really well and who needed to win far more than Kerry did were kind of saying oh well the Kerry are not having a great cl- uh, league season I saw now, that, yeah. it's absolutely the same with Dublin look at Dublin could potentially be in the middle of doing some reasonably heavy training at the moment they're not l- back long back from their holiday and stuff like that um, you know, they still have a, a huge amount of really good players to come back so I think on the back of a tour like if they lost by 17 points you'd be saying you know, it might be a bit of a crisis but they lost by 3 or 4 points so no, I'm sure Jim Gavin is not going to be drawn to. That's the thing. He came out pretty strongly against uh, uh, against it, but did actually make that point that we're exactly where we want to be, phys- you know, physically yeah. or whatever. So, like, I mean, Look at the, the, the big thing. No one is going to remember that league game in in six or seven weeks' time, or come come Super A time. And no. uh, if they win the All Ireland, that league game against Tyrone will be completely irrelevant. It far more um, benefit for Tyrone, I think, than it had for for Dublin. Um, you know, they had, Tyrone hadn't won for a game against Dublin for six seasons, I think, which I was kind of surprised at. But, you know, they really badly needed to win and they actually played very, very well. So, yeah. you know, maybe we should give them a bit more credit rather than saying yeah, Dublin were a bit no, off. Oh, geez, we, we eulogised about Tyrone. We're right back on the Tyrone banner because <laughs> yeah. they've finally taken our advice here on the show. And started kicking. And started kicking us. So, like, here's the, some stats on Tyrone. I'm glad you brought them up. So, by the end of the game, Tyrone had kicked 55 passes. 55 kick passes from Tron. Uh, incredible figure for them. So I can't remember where I was reading this. So this is, uh, did a comparison to their 2015 quarterfinal against Monaghan. Do you know how many times they kicked at that in that game? 10. Jesus. Isn't that some evolution? Now, it's not really an evolution over those four years. It's just a massive change in the last little while, in, probably this year. 10 times up to 55. Like, it's a clear strategy, like, I mean, which is... Like, I think that they deserve an awful lot of credit for it. Like, I mean, I was just, I was kind of amazed. They almost like the message was, you kick it. I don't mind if they go astray. I want to see you kicking it. And you're, you're, there's nobody going to be showing you the stats of how you made a balls of a kick pass. I want you to try it. So because they seem just completely 55 from 10 to 55. Mm. It's just great for the game in general. And isn't it interesting when you look at, say, Cora Finn's stats there, like they only give the ball away three times, but it was 30% kicking. Like people associate 35. kicking. 35%. Yeah. So people associate kicking with a risk. But if boys are moving and they get into space and you can find it, it's not really a risk. Yeah. Like Cora Finn never seems like a, a dodgy pass. It's just a natural thing because somebody's free. And like when you have Peter Hart in there, when you have Maddie Donnelly, Kelly McShane, proper ball winners. I saw Peter Hart's got like 221 or something already. Like that's what he needs to be doing. Like, yeah, like scoring those amount of pass like he's getting so many good passes as well yeah. and then he's in the right position to create things I think the game is so sophisticated now and it's moved on and the possession kind of thing is still so much in players heads you often hear the scaremongering about Jews will do you ever see the football in the 70s they're just lumping it down the field like Curafin are hand passing still 75% and they're brilliant or 65% and they're brilliant to watch because they're hand passing to get themselves out of trouble in the in the backs onto a certain point, then it's moving forward. It's still weighted more heavily with hand passing. There's just a lovely blend, you know. But like, it's not like Cara Finn are getting the ball in the full back line and just lumping it up to midfield. <laughs> so that's just dumb, you know. Like I mean, the game will never ever go back to that, Maddie. No, absolutely not. And neither should it. Look at with all respect, like a lot of the matches in the seventies were you, like you couldn't look at them now compared and to eighties. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, you couldn't. You know, and you know, but that's what happened at the time. And the game evolves and the game changes, and it absolutely is. But I think just back to Tyrone. Um, you know, we were talking about him a few weeks ago that, you know, they didn't have any targets in the full forward line. They absolutely had him at all stages yeah. almost the other night. And that's what allowed him to kick the ball 
Um, they had two and three guys inside probably 30 yards of most stage and some of their diagonal passing was, was top quality. Beautiful. But if you have targets in there and and you have other forwards up the field rather than sitting in your half back line, you know, the Dublin defenders have to kind of pick them up and it leaves space, it leaves one on, one-on-ones which any forward wants and which any team wants and I think that allowed Tyrone to kick an awful lot of ball the other night and you know, it, was, it was excellent to look at. Yeah, and that, like, I mean, you don't need to analyse too much the diagonal balls but it's amazing how many players don't do it and the value of a of a player for a, like the obvious ball is the ball running at the ball so when you're running towards the ball there's always a man up your arse because it's the obvious thing and cornerbacks know the obvious ball but you watch Gooch have you ever seen Gooch race a fella out towards the ball he won't do it Gooch runs away from the ball and lets the pass you yeah. you lets, lets the, pass the pass beat, beat the man. man. Yeah, you know, rather than yeah. and like that's the dream for a forward, Maddie. Like, I mean, when I was at the start of my career in the forwards, I'd always run at the ball because I was fast and I could get out in front. But like I wasn't a scorer. Scorers can't be making those runs because it takes you away from the scoring zone and it means that you're not really shaking your man off that that easily no you uh, to be honest a lot, a lot of the, the really good guys I looked at James O'Donnell a couple of years ago in Croke Park and all his movement was sideways which like defenders love running straight lines yeah. absolutely because you know you put a quick guy on you that's every bit as quick as you in a straight line he's a great chance of beating you or at least getting a hand in all you need is a yard going sideways one way or the other and a yard in, at that level is massive and you're going to win the ball yeah. and plus you're also staying in the scoring zone you start your run on the 21 run straight out by the time you get the ball you're 40 yards you're gone. happy days and there's, there's a value in that because I used to do that but I'd lay it off to someone and then they might give it into the two lads. Yeah. You, 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 I don't mind one lad doing that sacrificial yeah. run to, you know, to build, like in soccer, it's nearly like holding the ball up and the ball, yeah. the play moves up. But you don't want your scorers running out there. Like, I mean, and like you said, over and back, always in the scoring zone. And you have the defender then chasing shadows because he's not sure if the ball starts coming diagonal, then even a simple run towards the ball is tricking him because yeah. he's not really, like he's, he's totally confused, you know, it's, and it's the ball coming in. And Cara Finn do it, they never give it the obvious ball. Tyrone, like you said the other night, they work the done on the diagonal ball. And I could, you'd be so surprised because we're talking about diagonal balls here for <laughs> a few years. You'd be thinking Tyrone would be doing a lot more work on it. Yeah, and like the, the stats on Corofin as well was that they, they weren't going through the middle. Like there was that, that great sort of graphic where it was just this big open area from the 45 to the 20 in the middle of the field and they weren't in there because they weren't getting caught. That's where defences usually set up. So the balls were going out to the wing or across diagonally or straight into the 13 or 20 metre line, you know. So it was all safe passing even though it was all penetrating as well. Like, yeah. And that's what exactly what you saw with Tyrone with Hamsey picking out McShane. Like just over that barricade where normally people set up in the middle of the defence. Yeah, yeah. And just moving it fast. I look forward to talking to Gary Sice. Let's find out Cara Finn's secret. Yeah. Because like, I mean, I, I I just would love to play with him. Yeah. Imagine him just playing I and buzzing around, would wouldn't you? Like whenever you watched him, you said, geez, this just looks so enjoyable. It looks easy almost, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. They make it look easy. No, <laughs> yeah, they with, do. with all the pressure and everything that comes with playing in Crow Park and playing in an all-around club final, to be able to produce that st- level of football and not make silly mistakes because every player under that pressure, you know, might shit themselves yeah. and start doing stupid things. They don't. It's incredible <laughs> how in they fa- can live. In, in fairness to Crokes, they came out and tried to beat him at their own game as well. Like, you know, uh, Guido and Corofin, you know, Guido were a little bit more defensive and yeah. didn't find it t- take lo- a good bit longer to break them down and eventually pull away from them. But Crokes absolutely joined the party and really wanted to play football and you know that absolutely helped Corofin as well. It did, yeah. And uh, like, I mean, Nemo probably and Slocknail, but to beat all three big clubs like that in a final but and demolish them is, is incredible. Cahill McCarran has retired. So he was obviously injured at the end of last year. So he, I, I like his style today. He just sent a, a message on Twitter. Um, so he is with a tie in Kildare so the travelling back up to Tyrone must be a disaster and he's pushing on um, a little bit he won in All-Ireland in 2008 so um, it was in the Super 8s last year against Ross Common that he got the injury so like a top class cornerback um, uh, like Tyrone obviously are going pretty well but he would be a guaranteed starter if he was 100% for Tyrone this year yeah he's, like, he's still one of the best defenders like he's He's deceptively quicker. I don't know if he's smart or quick. I've never seen him really in a straight line run, but he always seems to be stuck on the defender. Like, you know, he yeah. never lets him go. He doesn't, and he attacks a lot and pisses his, his marker yeah, off. He probably got thing. that Ricey McManaman pretty much started that. Like, I mean, did you ever mark Ricey, Maddie? He he was the one, he, he started taking off, but his runs, I, in fairness to Ricey, Ricey, I don't think was necessarily doing him to throw his man off. Ricey was an inspirational type player, and at times in games, Ricey might just take it upon himself. We need this kind of lift, and mm. you'd see Ricey heading on. 
But McCarron and a lot of the cornerbacks now are doing it, I think, to actually just drag me man out of the way and make him tired. They are. The Dubs have kind of made it their business over the last couple of years. Like, Philly McMahon has kicked numerous points. Um, you know, lads like that going up the field. And look, at if you're, you're dragging one of the best forwards in the opposition away from the goal for f- five, ten minutes, sure, that can only help as well. Plus, you're putting pressure on the defence at the other side by carrying the ball forward. And these lads are, most of these inter-county footballers now are well at the score points from 25, 30, 45 yards. So, yeah. do you know, it's it's a, it's an attacking um, kind of a weapon as well as everything else. Yeah, I'm on for abandoning it. I think it's an absolute disgrace to the game attacking cornerbacks. Just leave them back in there. Not they the don't need to be getting <laughs> coming out. Anyways, another retirement is Owen Brosnan and he's our, our vintage um, Matty. So he tweeted during the week after 22 years with the Crokes team. Again, another not a, not a, just another quick Twitter tweet um, to announce the retirement. Another 22. After 22 years with the Crokes senior team, it's time to hang up the boots. Last Sunday didn't go our way and well done to Cara Finn. There's some side. I'm looking forward to cheering on the black and amber from the sidelines now. Huge memories of Owen Brosnan, an unbelievable weapon from running from deep, taking a ball around the 45, smashing through a tackle and then smashing it into the back of the net. He was an explosively exciting type of player like that when, when he was in his prime. Yeah, he's a huge man as well. Um, huge, yeah. Played international rules with him and did exactly the same as that. But I suppose the one memory everyone will have him is doing exactly that, is coming thundering down the middle onto a layoff pass from one of those one of these great carry boys and burying it in the back of the net. And like he just done it time after time with both yeah. Kerry and Dr. Croaks. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's had an unbelievable career, you know, and if anyone retired with probably a fifth of what he's won, I think they'd be all we'd be all very happy. <laughs> yeah, he's done it all. Like I mean, and he is it was a huge man. Like I mean, that's probably not even you know, thought about how big he was. Like yeah. when not only had he got how did he have so much speed when when he was such a big you know what I mean, big man. But then able to finish goals by just lashing them. Like oh, there's no, there yeah. was no subtlety about his no. finishes. <laughs> like when oh, he lift the nets or something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw yeah. Darren Solomon saying he's the most unstoppable coming onto a ball. Like the amount of tackles he broke just doing that. Yeah. yeah, no, he was very good at it. So just on that, it there was a little bit of speculation about what the Gooch is going to do. So Doctor Croak selector Edmund O'Sullivan said after the game, and this guy's Pat O'Shea does no media at all. He doesn't even do interviews before or after the game because I was on to him to come onto the show. And he says, no, uh, we'll get one of I'll get you one of the players. And in fairness to him, he went out of his way to get me a number of the players, whatever. He just do, he obviously doesn't do media. I remember him doing it when he was with Kerry. But yeah. anyways, um, so the selector was asked about Gooch's future. And we didn't talk about Gooch at all on Monday. I had it on my notes and I forgot. And he said, I thought he did quite well when he came on. It's a conversation we have to have with Colin, but he's a huge amount to offer. But I don't know if he'd be pre- prepared to offer it from the bench or starting. So I don't know um, what it is with him. I thought that was interesting. I thought he did quite well when he came on. He did very well c- in comparison to any other Crokes player on the field. He looked like he cared and looked like he was had a bit of uh, fight in him, which a lot of the Crokes, now, I think a lot of the Crokes lads, while we give all the credit to Cara Finn, there was an element of freezing on the big day with them, which Cara Finn just don't, don't do at all. But he did more than quite well. If you're comp- obviously comparing comparing him to Cara Finn, he did quite well. But comparing him to his teammates, he did very, very well. And I don't know. We uh, we were saying all year, Matty, is if there's six better forwards in any club team yeah. in the country than Gooch, like is it a bit of over confidence maybe from Crokes to think that they can go out and like I suppose they did it up until then, but not have the Gooch starting. I suppose. Look, you don't know what's you don't know what's happening uh, inside yeah. inside their camp. And look, in fairness, they do have very very good forwards. But um, I think if I would had anything to do with the team, I'd certainly like to see him playing. You know, even a co- even the outside of the left ball he yeah. gave in. Like I you mean, know, like you you play him somewhere like centre forward, and again, similar to the Gary Sy situation, get someone to do his running for him. But like you yeah. want to get him on the ball, he can see and do things still, and probably will for a good few years to come that no one will ever be able to do. Um, but like, you know, look at this. It's kind of a strange one to see, but you know, I think I'd be picking up the phone to him and asking, "Will yeah. he hang on for, for hang on for another year?" I, or two I don't think year? he will. I think I think he I think deep down, while he loves Crokes, I think he'll be livid about that year, lads. He's a winner and he's a starter all his life. To actually have to after all he's done for his club, I know I'd be fuming. Now he obviously might have a different personality, but he's a he's a fierce competitor. Like, and you might not think. Just because he's play so relaxed and everything, you saw the competitor in him probably at the weekend when he's running off, spraying the water on his nose mm. and wants to get back on. But for him to, for him to be, I, there's an element of disrespect, I think. Yeah. Like, I mean, Gooch should go out on his own terms, not as a sub coming on when the game's all over in Crow Park. I don't know. And I'm just talking as a huge 
Colin Cooper fan down yeah, through the years. And like, but he comes like the the aggression in him as well was like he wanted the ball. Like he was demanding it. Like I remember the first play, just come on, and it's like give it to him, give it to him. And I think it was number seventeen. The name escapes me, but it, it was on to Cooper the whole time. And your man just ran through and hit it wide instead of just popping. Saw it. that, yeah, that was a terrible. And, and he's the, there like balling him out. It was like give it to me, like you know. I'm Colin you, Cooper. But that was the difference. Cara Finn is going to pass that exactly, to the gooch there. Like, like, yeah. I mean, especially when it's when it's Cooper of all people, like you know, and the, he's just on and he's hungry and like, but again. I don't understand why crooks just don't be like right go and enjoy yourself now for a few months Colin like we'll see you in August or September come back out to training we'll get you ready for the championship and you know you don't need to go through this league with us or whatever else like, yeah. you know, just, just but manage if, that situation but, but the point of it what the, that's kind of fine but the point of it is if they say to Gooch you've the same role this year I'd yeah. say Gooch might say look I have, I have enough well, now. Uh, I'd rather play with the intermediates potentially and just play every Sunday yeah, well, and enjoy probably, it's probably hard to see him not having started almost every game this year and then all of a sudden or last year sorry going into this year and then all of a sudden in 2019 right well you're kind of back in the starting squad like a kind of the role yeah. looks like one a diminished one as opposed to one that's going to improve yeah. over yeah, the next when, season yeah and when their policy is the young lads and the future well, you can't go back on that then yeah. unless Pat O'Shea steps down and maybe, you know, a new manager comes in and goes, well, we need his, like, I always remember Johnny Doyle, like, he was always on the Kildare team for as long and it was like, isn't it great to have that experience? Yeah. Whereas then other counties are like, the minute you hit that age, it's like, well, we need to concentrate on the future and we're going with youth. And it's like... Well, Colin Cooper was once the future and you, you were developing him to get him as the finished it's ageism. product. It's ageism. It, it is. I think it is. So, yeah. it is. The, the idea of investing in youth is to get them as the finished article and you have the finished article yeah. in Colin Cooper. Yeah. Use him. I was, to, I, last year with the Portlaoise Intermediates, I was told, um, now I played the first round and then got injured for two games. So it was, then it was the semi-final and I was back fit, but I'd only played a challenge match the week before and I was told, we're going with youth. And so I wasn't starting and I was just walking away thinking to myself, like, does does form not ever come into it or <laughs> are you actually that is complete example if that was said to you in the workplace you would have a, a legal case it's, claim, it's complete ageism <laughs> like I mean how about my performance yeah <laughs> <Or what>? like, <laughs> we're going with you so immediately because of your age you I'm ruling you out <laughs> I know you're far better like you know and I know we were developing you for all the years but it doesn't matter like, yeah. you know, we're going with you horrific stuff but anyways I'm going to leave you on a lovely little passage from Paul Galvin's uh, book Who's on the Gooch and it, um, this Tony Lean had a very good piece in the Examiner on Gooch where I, fa- where I saw this that reminded me of it. Um, this is Galvin on the Gooch. He stood still where other forwards would run. Having the nerve to wait and wait and wait until the right moment is a rare quality. He moves in circles when everyone else moves in straight lines. The defender will move towards the ball, then realise Gooch hasn't moved at all. So he turns around to look for him. And when he does, he's dead. That's when the gooch strikes. It's a beautiful thing, (laughs) isn't it? It sums it up perfectly. All right, we'll come back with Gary Sice. All right, so Cara Finn, as we know by now, became only the fourth club to win back-to-back All-Irelands on Sunday. And Gary Sice joins us on the line. who scored 1-5 in the final. Gary, how are you doing this? You're strolling through All-Ireland finals. Oh, I don't know about strolling through Ireland finals or anything like that, but uh, we've had two very good days in Crow Park the last two years, and we've enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah, how, like, I mean, it's just about performing on the big day, I suppose, and it's not like with club teams you're playing there a lot, like the inter-county uh, competitions. You only get one game to perform in Crook Park every year, and the three All-Ireland finals ye have played, you've performed to your very maximum, it looked like, to, to outsiders on those three big days. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that one, Willie. I don't know what it is. It's just we seem to enjoy ourselves when we get to Crow Park. And I don't know, is it the surface or is it just the surroundings or what is it? But uh, we've an awful lot of lads who seem to step up on that particular day. And thank God they've done it because uh, it's particularly satisfying to do it on that day. Well, that's the thing. Stay in the club game. Yeah, is there nerves in the dressing room? Or are you relaxed? Like you you have been through it before, but you still did it against Slock Nail. You know what I mean? When it would have been this group's uh, first one. I don't know. I think it was just a, a, a quiet focus more than anything else. I think those lads are, a lot of those lads are used to winning a lot of, at a uh, underage level on the way up. A lot of them would have played for Galway along the way at different levels. They, it's not their first day going out in a big game or anything like that. Yeah. I think they just applied their knowledge to it and, and went along and just did very well. Simple as that and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. So, Camir, how were the celebrations? Um, you had a homecoming. You're well used to this routine. Does it change or do you stick to the same plan? Uh, we 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 stayed in in Johnson House on Sunday night and then came home on Monday and we went around and met up with everybody. It was lovely and Sunday night was lovely particularly because a lot of our just our families were around, and um, so that was really really nice. Monday was more 
the club and everyone together with a big homecoming at the pitch, which was fantastic for all the kids and all that kind of stuff. And then we did a tour of the parish last night, which was even nicer again because we got to go and see some of the people at their houses and just share the moment with them really. And it was it was um a huge evening of celebration and rightly so it needs to be celebrated yeah so like I mean what do you just go on a bus around to the different areas and stop at people's literally, houses literally yeah literally and stopped off at the local pubs and stopped off at houses of, of very important people in our parish and people that have been very good to us over the last 24 months and probably a lot longer than that really um, older players that are around and, and people that are just very important in the life of our club and uh, I think it's a very special thing to do and it's very special for the players and the younger lads especially to see this yeah to be uh Grateful to those people that have made us what we are. That's fantastic stuff altogether. And is this the first year you've done that? No, no, we've done it last year as well. And it's something we do after county finals actually here in the parish. We just do a small bit of a tour and literally a trail of cars madness behind us. And we just go around to the local areas and have the crack really. And it's, it's lovely. It's really nice. And it really ties the whole thing together, you know. Right. So you've got a, yours is kind of a parish. Do you have like a, do you have a chalk Mickey like they have in Guido or where you all, uh, I don't, look? I don't think anyone has that. <laughs> <like that. laughs> I don't know if anyone has. Uh, I, we have, we have two kind of main areas. We'd have Curfin and Belclare. So we'd go to Rafferty's and Curfin and we'd come to Canavan's and Belclare. And, uh, as I say, we haven't got a boombox quite as big as the one in Guidor, but we do all right for ourselves when we go at it, you know. Yeah, you must have done some laughing yeah. when you saw the, the call-outs the boys were doing before the semi-final. Like, I mean... Uh... Yeah, there's some characters in fairness to them. It was, it, was, uh, it was funny enough in fairness to them. It was guests. They looked like they were totally enjoying their victory anyway, that's for sure. <laughs> they definitely were. Come here, I want to talk to you about your goal. Because uh, Farher's running through, he's in the middle. You have your hand up, you're calling for it. You want it early. If you got it early, you probably would have had to shoot. Um, Faraher Dahi Burke cuts across behind Faraher and Faraher has a sixth sense just to know that he's crossed across him and gives it to him and then it goes to Ian Burke and then it goes across to you and you kind of slam dunk it into the net at that stage like I mean this isn't the first time we've seen great intricate passing um, goals from yourselves like do you do much work on that or you know the obvious pass for Faraher in that situation was was down to you because you were in his line of vision well, thanks for the God he didn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way I would have scored from where I was at. Uh, this was a brilliant piece of decision making for Martin, I suppose. Yeah. Really. And I think Dahi knew, Dahi knew coming that if he was making a proper run that Martin would have given it to him. Um, and I think just a pretty good decision making. And then at the end of it all, you want Ian Burke, don't you? Yeah. If someone's going to make a good decision in front of the goal, it's going to be Ian Burke and I just happen to be lucky enough to be the back post. Um, just... Uh, I, I don't know. The opportunity opened up and we just did what, did what we saw in front of us, I suppose. And, do you, do you, do you, as I said, you had... What I'm wondering, do you do a lot of work on those type of moves? Uh, it wouldn't be something we're overemphasising or anything. It's just trying to get people to make the right decisions at the right time. I, I, I think I think Bernie was probably doing the same thing the far side of the field. Obviously, he doesn't get the plaudits, but it's making the right decision on the field. What you see as the right decision and to do the quickest possible, I suppose. That's yeah. probably what we're trying to do all the time um, but it just happened to come off in Crow Park on the biggest day of the year for the club and it was just nice to finish it off I suppose but as I said it, it could have been finished off two or a few different ways it just happened at the end of it Because we were we were talking on the show on Monday it's like the three man weave and a lot of people kind of laugh at that move but like there's, even the goal you scored against Nemo there's a lot of that kind of running across a man and taking defenders away a different direction but it ending up you know kind of back with the player you weren't expecting it to be back with yeah, I don't know. I, I've seen I seen a few comments about the three man weave over the last couple of days. All right, I don't know <laughs> if it's three man weave or anything like that, but it's it's just a, literally a case of try and get yourself into a good position. And if you're in a good position, hopefully the guy on the ball can see you and give it to you in time and give it to you as quick as possible, so to give you max on time to make a decision yourself. Yeah, and I think we're lucky enough to have a, a good few footballers around each other at the moment that understand that very well and seem to be doing it as best best they can. Trying to do as often as you can is the big big problem because teams are teams are good at defending at that level. Well, that's the thing. Teams to yeah, that's the thing. That's the problem. Like, um, I just think we we got it right on Sunday. Thank God again, and, and hopefully, hopefully we'll get another shot at it sometime to do it again. Yeah, but, uh, I don't think it's anything specific we talk about. It's just something that came off for us. I think you just have real natural players who who instinctively make that right decision. You know, like I mean, it's just you can yeah, co- you could, yeah, really good players. Yeah. yeah, and like you could coach fellas who weren't as good a hundred times, and they'll panic and do the wrong thing at the at, you know at the wrong time. But good players. Um, we'll pick the right decision. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I think it's just a case of that. Yeah. Yeah. So when Kevin O'Brien took over from Stephen Rochford, did he would he have changed much up in training? Like, has he put his own stamp on the team, or is a lot of this a legacy of Stephen Rochford's management? Because we know he's such a highly rated manager. 
I think it's a, it's a continuation of a couple of things. Kevin was there with Stephen all the way through the three years and Stephen yeah. was there as well and I think they, they kind of came together and, and came up with a plan and I think the team has changed an awful lot since Stephen is there as well and I think he, he worked very well with the group he had and made the most of that group for us and I think Obi has kind of continued that on and trying to perform with what we have and to improve and to kind of move things around to suit the group we have now and they both worked in tandem excellently and then Obi went along and and has done a very good job on his own now as well with the backroom team he has and they're excellent in their own right Yeah, if you have a new role in the team like you're playing a lot closer to goals now you know, like I mean I know you are pushing on but you're not you're not given that really grafting half hour job Lundy and Leonard did that on, on Sunday you, you're given more of a playmaking role in front of the full forward line is that fair? Yeah, a little bit yeah, look I'm, I'm not getting any younger and I've had enough time out there dogging at number 10 I'm sure you've had a foot of yourself for a good <laughs> yeah. as well there's no high five for that job um, it's, 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 it's an awful difficult role and on occasion I will go out there and try and add my bit to it but I have been moving a little bit closer maybe playing slightly more closer to the goal which is no harm I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the role to be honest with you yeah I'm sure but you do. Say, it's, it's down, yeah I do and it, it gives me a different different perspective on it altogether it's not bad considering I started as a cornerback so uh, it is a different role, but I'm totally enjoying it. Yeah, you started out as a cornerback because uh, my first uh, first uh, recollection of you is as a number seven, a wing back, because I always notice wing backs. And then you went to number ten, and it, that's the modern game. Then if you can play wing back, you can play number ten. But then the further role as a playmaker, like that's a completely new role for someone who would have started out number or cornerback, wing back. It is, it is, and and again, I'm playing with a lot of good footballers around me. So provided I started making the right moves and started getting into the right places, I just want to get the passes I, I needed and. I think I, I've had to hold my game a small bit and diff, it's different now than it was three or four years ago since because I'm getting that little bit older. Um, and it's just a different way of playing and it kind of suited again with the group that we had. There was there's a gap there and a couple of guys came behind me that were able to put in more mileage at wing, for, wing, wing forward than I was. So it was a case of change and move on and try and do something different to help the group. Yeah, and so would you have to do much work on your finishing then? Or like, I mean, you're known for scoring spectacular goals, anyways. And you got was it one seven in the semi, and then one five. You got one four against Nemo um, last year. Like, I mean, your scoring tallies. I know you're on the freeze, but like, I mean, you are scoring a lot heavier than what you would ha- you you would have a few years ago. I think it's 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 kind of a, a case of I've been up there now for a while, and even through training sessions, I'm starting to figure out where the spaces are and starting to figure out where I'm going to get scores from. Um, that's probably the most thing I've tried to concern myself with. I think once you start figuring out where the gaps and spaces are, you can try and get in, into them more often in training and then hopefully get a transfer across to the pitch. But the other thing is too, I'm getting nice I'm getting nice passes. I'm getting yeah. good ball from good players. And that's, a, that's as you know, that's a big thing when you're playing as a forward. You can make an awful lot of runs and get an awful lot of bad passes and it can look terrible. Or you can make the same runs and get good passes and it can make things look an awful lot better. Simple as that. And yeah. oftentimes it's the guy giving you the ball that makes the space for you. So, that's probably where I've been very lucky. I've had a lot of good guys give me a lot of good passes. Yeah, I'd have to like say I, I have to say I'm jealous when I watch Cara Finn play. I just love to play on that forward line. Like you just throw it around. Everyone's getting on it. Like you, you wouldn't go ten minutes without having get got your hands on the ball. You know that kind of way. It's pure selflessness up there and vision and all those great things. It must be an incredibly enjoyable team to play on. That's very very enjoyable. Yeah. Every, you know that everyone is looking for the space for you everyone's looking for each other everyone's trying to get the ball moving and it's just very enjoyable they're, they're a nice group you're on whether you're on the pitch playing ball with them or whether you're off the pitch having a cup of coffee or having a bit of crack or whatever it is it's just a nice group you're on I think that makes it a little bit easier as well when you're on the field and you can kind of trust each other a bit more and you can you can try these things without getting too much stick now you, you get it when you deserve it but nine times out of ten it'll be a positive rather than a negative you'll get and that's, that's very helpful and very important yeah, yeah. I saw some of the stats from your first half. They were out of control. You had 128 passes. Only four of those 128 led to turnovers. Like I mean, and that, two of them are mine. And we're two of them yours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You're reminded yeah. of that, anyways. Nice to keep uh, stop your head getting too big that you get you're reminded. Not, yeah, that, that's not going to happen around the desk. Let me tell you, there's no way, no fear of that. But I'm sure when you're sitting in the pub on the Monday. Um, and you're reading the papers and you know one in my experience one or two players might always come in with a paper and you might flick through it or whatever and like I mean to see the company you're being spoken um, you know you're being mentioned with now the great Cross McGlenn team and now you're being mentioned in the same bread it must be really satisfying for a club that you love for the whole country to be speaking about it the way we are yeah, it wasn't our intention starting off with this. Now we're, it won't be our intention going forward. It's very nice that other people have their opinions on us and it's satisfying to a point all right but it's more satisfying from an internal point of view that we went and did our football in Crow Park and that's that's what we were aiming to do and try and 
I suppose, increase our performances as the year went on, going from game five or six as far as game 12. And, and that's the most satisfying of the whole part of it, that you, we, we, we did go out and produce our own stuff, the stuff we wanted to do, the stuff we'd worked hard on. We went in and completed it on the biggest day. That's the most satisfying part of the whole lot of it. Yeah, no, definitely. And come here, you're back in work today. We're doing this interview on a Wednesday. So you had Monday and Tuesday, you're back in work on Wednesday. So like, I mean, this is the older leaders on the team always go back to work earlier than everybody else. Yeah, maybe not able for what the younger <laughs> lads are able for either. Mentally not able for what they're at. But uh, yeah, I'm back today and, and it's a good old buzz around the place. I'm working in the primary school in Belle Claire, uh at home. So the place is absolutely going bananas here, which is fantastic. And it's a, it's a different kind of buzz, but it's a good old buzz all the same to be here with them and see the kids curfew and jerseys all over the place. And everyone's trying to do me solos today out in the yard and having the crack. And it's very enjoyable now, to be honest with you, to be back today. Nice, so- nothing, nothing too stressful and... No, so did the children give you a cheer when you walk in this morning? Did or how? Does I I have six class and they're they're a particularly honest group. Uh, <laughs> so I I got I got I got a bit of praise and I got mixed in with a small bit of honesty as well, which is no harm. Bring you back down to ground very quickly. <laughs> and and, uh, and there was one particular hand pass in the first half. I tried to get to Mike Farrer and missed him completely and rolled over the sideline. And two young lads didn't wait two seconds to nail me with it when I walked in the door. So <laughs> it, it, it's a bit of a it's, it's a very sobering moment as well. But it's good crack here now today, which is which is, uh, which is important. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Come here. Um, last year only Ian Burke was on the Galway team. Like, I mean, how does this sit with people in Corrafin? Do you think they should be represented? It better or you know considering the strength of your team or how how do those conversations go they don't happen an awful lot to be quite honest with you that's that's a whole different ball game it's a whole different setup in there and yeah it's up to the individuals if they want to go and play for Galway to go and play for Galway but uh, it doesn't really rankle as a whole lot Galway are going very well at the moment and it's up to our lads to push on and hopefully get their places now when they go back in yeah, okay, fair enough. You don't want to talk about that too much because I know you've been very uh, complimentary of Kevin Walsh and his, uh, you know, the the structures he brought in there and the professional approach. When you compare got the way Galway played to Cora Finn, there are, you know, there are pretty big differences. Do you think maybe Galway should, you know, evolve a it's little a bit more? It's a whole different level though, Willie. Yeah. It's a whole different level. It's a whole different ball game. The club game and the inter-county game are not the same. And anyone who's actually in it and involved will understand that. It's a very, very different setup. You're up against a different level of fitness, a different level of athleticism, different systems. There's different things at stake and it's just different. That's the long and short of it. Yeah. We do it one way and they do it another and our way is working for us and at the moment their, work, their, way, their way is really working for them. So uh, it's just very different but you're getting the same thing at the moment and I, I don't really care as long as go away to be honest with you how things are getting, getting done. Yeah. They've adapted to the modern way of doing things and they're performing to a very good level and as a goal supporter, that's all I want to see, really. Is there that's an, as simple as that. Yeah. Is there something we just mentioned on the podcast? Because Dr. Crokes wouldn't have a huge represent representation on the Kerry team either. Like, is there something to, re- to read into that? Or is this just like the two best club teams in the country? Maybe th- not having the huge stars or something? I don't know whether to over I, overthink I, it or... I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure if we went back over the last couple of years of, of the, the club teams that have been in all Ireland finals, I'm sure you pick out a fair few footballers that have played into county football along the way. I don't think there's anything in that. I think it's just a case of just the way it was this year. But with that, yeah. hopefully some of our lads will drive on. I've no doubt that some of the Cork lads are going to drive on as well. There's a lot of really good footballers there that will surely get an opportunity to wear the curry jersey as they go along. Yeah, uh, you're in, back into the Galway League already now, right? Apparently so, yeah. I don't know how much league <laughs> football I'm going to see the next couple of weeks. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. I don't know when that's going to start now. I think, I think we missed the first round over, over last Sunday, but I'm sure it'll kick off fairly soon again. We'll back into it. A couple of young lads could do with games after this week, I'm sure too. Well, that's it. You'll play your intermediates or something and give them ah. give them senior games. Or... I'm not sure. Can I go on again and see how we go? Yeah, exactly. Come here, I won't keep you any longer. Um, Gary, thanks very much for taking the call and congratulations. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with Division 1 here, lads. I'm calling this Paddy Power Permutations rather than Paddy Power Predictions. See what I've done there. Um, so Kerry, we're starting off with Division 1 and Kerry are pretty much in the final, lads. So all they need is a draw or better against Ross Common. That guarantees it. But even if they lose, they'll only be in trouble if both Galway and Mayo win. Then it'll be a three-way tie and then it goes to score, score difference and their score difference is much better than Galway and Mayo. They're a little bit like Meath in Division 2. So Kerry are in the final. So then you have Mayo into the mix and they can't lose to Monaghan um, because they'd lose a head-to-head with Galway. They've lost to Galway. If both Galway, Mayo and Kerry all win, 
well then Mayo will lose out because Galway have beaten them on the head to head and it's just a two way so like I mean they have to win and they have to hope Tyrone uh, beat Galway you know or a draw once Tyrone lose to Galway a win or a draw will do them Galway Tyrone won then because obviously Kerry and Mayo are playing teams that are not into the mix so both Galway and Tyrone can still make the final Mm. Um, Galway have a couple of different ways they can make it if they beat Tyrone um, a Kerry win a Mayo draw or defeat um, a draw would actually do them as long as Mayo don't win so they could they're the two ways if Mayo don't win a, a draw or a win will do Galway even if they win and Mayo win they'll still go ahead of Galway are you all following this so Tyrone Tyrone one then is very simple they have to beat Galway and they have to hope Mayo lose to Monaghan so there, it's not out of the no. question that any of those four Kerry are in or any of those three they, I think the Galway Tyrone game we might just focus on that because obviously we've talked a lot on the show about Tyrone's kicking game and I always find with teams it should be like horses for courses so Tyrone are going out against Galway now who have a different style to Dublin in that they'll have players drifting back ahead of the ball so that early kick pass while it works against Dublin because they press up the field so that's on Against against Galloway, if Tyrone go with those same kicking tactics, they're not going to get as much joy out of it, Maddie, because Galloway have full time sweeper and they'll also have lads that are t- maybe turning their back to the play and getting back into their zone. So Tyrone nearly have to not abandon their running game for a game like this. But then a game against maybe Kerry or Dublin, that kick pass is absolutely on. Yeah, it is. And that's 100% right. You know, we're talking about that. Uh Monaghan's hand passing or Tyrone's hand passing stats again Monaghan a couple of years ago and probably a lot of it to do was with the way Monaghan were playing yeah. and you know Galway's going to be something similar at the weekend where they will get bodies behind the ball they've done it all year and they're not they're probably not going to change at this stage and why should they they've been quite successful doing it so like Tyrone absolutely have to adapt they can get the ball and can keep kicking it in but it's going to keep coming back out to them you know with Pete, likes of Peter Hart and Matty Donnelly and Colin McShane in there great ball winners but when they win the ball they're going to be surrounded by two and three Galway fellas so the ball is going to be turned over anyway so but look at that's going to be nothing new to Tyrone they're, they're, they're well able to do that they're at home and you know they're they're not going to be too worried about probably having to change back to something that they're very very good at anyway that they'll be very comfortable with that's the thing but it's it's, it's an aghast like I mean you see so many teams just with the one game plan mm. now Tyrone I think have two like they should Dublin have two it's just Dublin practice they're running one so much that when they actually play a team that the kicking game works, it's almost like they're they're out of practice a little bit with it. But Tyrone now, you know, if they play Mayo, Kerry, Dublin, they have that game plan. They've, they've shown us that. But against Galway, Conan, it's obviously going to be a completely different thing and it's going to be one of those games of chess and it's going to be hand passing, you know, outside a screen yeah. and, you know, the, all the analysis that goes into trying yeah. to get through that. Which, which they can play, yeah, but like, they, I think they should also try that the kicking that when it's on. I can see if it works, if they can get it ahead of their man getting back. And they can get it from a kick out because yeah. Galway press up in a kick out. That's the only point. If they win a kick out and transfer it very quick, they can yeah. get some joy back, to, you know, from set kick outs, which are a lot in a game, anyways, on both sides. So, mm. like, the kicking game isn't redundant. It's just in general play, you'll find Galway will have lads back at say. Yeah, yes. there's only certain times sorry, you'll be able to do it and probably from turnovers another time you know, for Galway defensively aren't set and there, there's going to be a certain number or a certain amount of them in the game as well so you know, once to pick and choose and look you have to kind of rely on players on the field to be able to see when it's on and when yeah. it's not on there's yeah. certain times you just you just can't kick you just can't afford to What I would hate to see and I don't, I don't think this is on television but I would hate if we see some stats where Tyrone kicked it 55 times as well it would be like ah lads <laughs> do you know what I mean? It would yeah. like Jesus have you put any thought into into this at all is yeah. this just is this now your only one game plan rather <laughs> you know that w- I was just going to say that I would hate to see them having like 10 kick passes I would like to see them trying a bit more like you know when I think like the beauty of McShane Donnelly and Hart is that it's three different types of ball winners like where you have McShane just strength they can stand one on one and win the ball and Donnelly's a bit more powerful coming on to it and Hart's obviously more skillful and agile like you know so it's three different options so whilst yeah you want them to be a bit smarter and play the game as they see it but like still have that element where they're thinking they need to sort of look up to see what's on here and not just always have their head down and run with it. Yeah, no, that's true. So, so like, I mean, we have to give Galway some credit and I, I touched on this on Monday. So Galway have been missing during the league. Uh, Damien Cole, Maureen Burke, um, uh, Brannigan, Liam Silk and Killian McDade. Five guaranteed starters, I'd say, for the summer. McDade has played so well in the early rounds of the league. I think he'll be an attacking wing back. Their best man marker, Liam Silk. Um, Eamon Brannigan their guaranteed wing forward from last year Ian Burke all-star Damien Comer 
what they're doing is phenomenal. Like when you look back two years ago, they're in Division Two. Now they get up to Division One and they play their championship team in most games and hit it with an intensity and they make a league final, then an R in semi final. Now this year, with an experimental team, they're not just surviving in Division One. They're actually like they've a really established Division One team now, and you can criticize their 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 style of style. Play. But like I mean, you look at it as well. Their style of play. It's taken Mickey Hart maybe six years to come out of that. Like, they're not in that stage yet. So, like, Kevin Walsh still has, you know, the rest of this year to potentially... And when with Comer, Ian Burke and these lads back, he'll have seen Cara Finn. He'll have seen Tyrone. I wouldn't be definitely ruling Ter- Galloway out of evolving even this year alone. I think they evolved as last year went from being really, really defensive in the league. Remember the Kildare game in Newbridge, a fantastic attack in football. Um, you know, so like, I mean, I don't want to be over critical of Galloway. The only thing I keep saying about Galloway is that I'm a big fan of them and I love their, some of their forwards and I would love to see them play more of a Corofin style because I think they have the players to do it. Yeah, I wouldn't be too harsh on Galway either, to be fair. Like, to still have the potential to play lots of football because that's what the guys have in them naturally anyway. And look at the way they're playing is the way they're playing and it suits them, but they, they can still absolutely switch and go and play kind of football football where they're doing an awful lot of kicking because they have the players to do it and you know you mentioned five or six guys have missed the whole National League I'm sure there's two or three extra guys from from Corofin that, that Kevin Walsh will have his eye on as well you bring well, in six Kira, seven eight yeah. new players you know that's a huge amount and particularly guys that are going to be really competing for first 15 place and uh, you know I think Galway are in a very good place and I think they're you know, I wouldn't say nailed on but like I think they're absolutely one of the favourites to be in an Ireland semi-final again and look at once you get to there you never know yeah that's it I think Kieran Malloy gets on it this oh, year definitely. I think we've seen yeah, enough yeah. of him with Cara Finn to know that he let add an attacking element and I think if McDade was their other wing back that's danger there because I do think they're, they're half back line when you have a Gary O'Donnell who's around a long time and is a very good player you have Garrett Bradshaw and you have Wynn or you have um, what are the two twins names The I'll think of it in a second you don't have too much pace in that half back line or danger going forward like you know James McCarthy or Jack McCaffrey or you know the Kerry speedy half back yeah. line like I mean the I think when you have if you have two dangerous wing forwards uh, or two dangerous wing backs then you have the two Farahers. You have Dylan Wall, you have Jason Leonard who will be in the mix. Like, I think Martin Farahers put his hand up to be getting a, getting a start there. But, like, I mean, you have young Ole who's flying it. Uh, Galloway have an incredible, Class. incredible bunch of players. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that they, when they were playing uh, Killian McDade, they were playing him wing forward, but it seems more defensive to put him wing forward than it would be to put him wing back. It would be a much more statement of intent to have him in Malloy. As you're attacking wing backs. I think so. Now they were missing a lot of forwards. So yeah. I, I think eventually he will he'll see him as a wing back. He was wing back under twenty one. When you have so many lads out in the forward line, you know, maybe I'm thinking that's why. Yeah, I no, do. you're probably right. And like it is like the, the depth that they have is incredible. And we always give like, you know, Kerry and Mayo a free pass when it comes to the league and we sort of know that they're gonna be better in the championship and we should probably do that with Dublin because we know what their their squad is like and the same with Galway like that. Like that's potentially the second or third best squad in the in the country. Yeah, yeah. no, it definitely is, isn't it? Yeah, like they've, I mean, all, they've always had an embarrassment of forwards, to be honest. And being able to being able to release McDade and put him back into half back line will be a huge thing. And to be honest, the way teams are playing now, um attacking from breaks and from or from turnover, sorry, is the best way to go. And the likes of him and Malai going forward, mm. you know, and they, they, awfully, they will absolutely add probably more than the likes of Gary O'Donnell, as you say, who's getting on, but who's still a very, very good player. But the, the pace which them lads attack at and naturally do it, you know, can only be good for Galway, you know. Yeah. I'd say Kevin Walsh is, is very happy with where his year has gone so far. Because we won't go ageist on O'Donnell and Bradshaw. We put them centre back <laughs> and hold in the centre, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is a great role and Bradshaw is well able to play that role. And I think Gary O'Donnell, whether Gary O'Donnell has the legs to get up and down the wing, with, with probably lacking a little bit of pace. Then in midfield, you're talking about Tomas Flynn, you have Kieran Duggan, you have Peter Cook, who's been playing wing forward the whole league, and you have Paul Conroy to come back. Keen Darcy as well had a big Sigurdsson Cup. Like, you know, he's an all athletic midfielder. Like, you know, it's incredible what they have. They have a great bloody team. <laughs> they have a great, I've tipped them three, three years ago, I tipped them to win the All Ireland in three years. This is my last year, Matty. So, like, I'm hanging. <laughs> I've been overcritical of Galloway because I just want them to make the improvements uh, this year to try and get my prediction. If that prediction came in, lads, I just retire. That's it. I've reached it. it. That's it. You will never, ever beat that prediction. (laughs) So Cavan are down pretty much because even if they win, they can't get above Monaghan. So they're relegated, um, pretty sure. So it's between Roscommon and Monaghan. Roscommon have Kerry at home. Monaghan have Mayo away. So 
I don't know, it's a toss-up. Kerry are true. So, like, I mean, Ross Common could frustrate and potentially get a result there. Kerry weren't overly impressive. Monaghan against Mayo. Mayo have to win. Might be a more difficult one. So I wouldn't think that, you'd, obviously, Monaghan would be favourites. But I wouldn't be surprised if that went either way. Um, Division 2, it's all kicking off in Division 2 as well, lads. So there's a whole load of teams. Mead, Donegal, Fermanagh and Kildare. All four of them can make the final. Nearly a similar situation. Um, I'd say identical situation, actually. All playing each other, are they? Yep. They're all playing each other, yeah. <laughs> so you have Armagh who are playing for nothing. And we ran through the Cork, uh, Tipperary, Clare permutations um, last week. So Cork, if Tipperary, uh, whoever wins between Clare and Tipperary will obviously stay up. Cork can stay up if Clare beat Tipperary because they've already, or if Tipperary beat Clare because they've already beaten Tipperary. Are you following this? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so then in me, they're up. We've pretty much said that they're in a situation with Kerry where their scoring difference is so good that even if Donegal um, and Fermanagh win, they'll all be on 10 points, but me, the super, the super score, score difference. difference. So that's moment, it. So. so it's between Fermanagh, uh, Donegal and Kildare. So Donegal, if they beat Kildare, they're up. Um, if they draw, they need for Manit to lose or draw. And if they lose, they just, uh, nothing happens. They just stay up in Division 2. For Manna, win puts them up if Donegal don't win. Um, a draw will keep them up if Kildare beat Donegal. And Kildare need to beat Donegal and hope for Manna lose to Mead. Any of those situations could happen. I fancy Mead to beat for Manna. And if Mead beat for Manna, you're looking at Kildare, Donegal, winner takes, kind yeah. of winner takes all. And like, I mean, that's going to be a really interesting one. Like, I mean, Kildare going away to Donegal. Last year, they played when they're in Division 1. They're both relegated last year from Division 1. But it was Owen Doyle. Remember the the, the gum shield, the gum shield uh, controversy? Yeah. And Kildare were right in that game and they were, they were playing really well. And they, they feel that they were cheated out of that game. So there might be a little bit of spice to this one as well. Like, I mean, Kildare are almost back to full strength. Donegal are nearly back to full strength. So there'll be I think there'll be a bit of a championship feel about this one. The will both teams are obviously going to want to go to Division One and get to get to a league final in Croke Park, but I think only in the last couple of weeks Donegal have looked a totally different team with Michael Murphy back and that's you know, that's no surprise. Um, you know, he was out, yeah. outstanding again down in Cork the other day and he was the difference when he came on in the Armagh game in you know the horrendous conditions up in Donegal a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, I think the home advantage um with Michael Murphy back, I think they'll have their tails up. Um and you know, Kildare have had a few kind of iffy results through the league. Now look at her still absolutely in with a shout of getting there, but you know, you, I I think I'd have to fancy Donegal at home, not to not to let the, that one that one slip at this stage. Yeah, I think I fancy Donegal as well. I'm not sure the odds are four to nine. Kildare are outsiders over two to one. But like I mean, when you look at Kildare, right, so Kevin Flynn was back the last day. So he's their attacking wing back who's a really good player. Peter Kelly was back for the last two games. They have a lot of their backs or players back. Tommy Mulick is back in midfield with Kevin Feely. Like, I mean, then you've got a... Fo- Here's the forward line, because everyone thinks Kildare are decimated. Niall Kelly wasn't a definite starter last year in the championship. So Daniel Flynn is obviously missing. Jimmy Highland is in. So Jimmy Highland, he's a young player, brilliant under 21. Daniel Flynn's such an exciting player. But at least you have a replacement. So they still have a forward line of Fergal Conway, um, Paul Cribben and Keith Cribben, which was last year's half forward line. And their full forward line then will be Neil Flynn, um, Paddy Brophy and Jimmy Highland. Still not bad, lads, you know, and this is yeah. from a Super 8 team last year. So, like, I mean, sometimes when Kildare kind of stutter around during the league and everything, you tend to say that they're not a force. They absolutely will be a force if they build on last yeah. year. That's, it is the exact same for him, except you've just replaced Daniel Flynn with one of the best yeah. under 21s in the last while. You might put Paddy Brophy in full forward instead of Daniel Flynn, but that offers you a no, completely different option, you know, who's a much bigger man and mm. won't be racing out in front, won't give you that out ball but we'll give you another option. And it's almost like a traditional old school full forward where you've got Neil Flynn and Jimmy Highland who are both small in stature, yeah. like your old stereotypical corner big, forward big finishers. Man, man, and then yeah. your big man, <laughs> big man. I like the look of it. Yeah, no, look at it. It absolutely is a good looking forward line. Um, they haven't been scoring particularly heavy during the league where I think Donegal are starting to, to, to probably rack up some better scores over the last couple of weeks but I see um, you know, Donegal were, were starting to filter back in some of the Guido lads last week as well yeah. and, you know um, Brophy and, and uh, 
and uh, Neil McGee on the edge of the square probably could be one that's worth paying in to look at alone. It'd and be a good if, one, yeah. If, if that materialises, but I think you know just Donegal with a bit of momentum to have over the last couple of weeks and a couple of players starting to come back in. Um, like I said, like some obviously Michael Murphy plus the long with the Guido lads. Um, I think they're they're just maybe starting to come right at the right time mm. for them in the, in the league. Yeah, Paddy McGrath got back, and uh, Michael Langan and Jason McGee. McGee was suspended. Langan was injured. They're back this week as well. So. Donegal are looking pretty close to full strength outside of McBrearty now. Yeah, Darrow O'Brien now is showing up as well. Like He's getting in the mix, yeah. Yeah, like, and it's a straight shootout now, you know, to get into Division 1 as well. I almost forget that because you're thinking about getting into the Division 2 final, but you know, Donegal win this at home. They're in Division 1 again, where they should be. Like so, yeah, I I buy fancy them for this. Who do we, who do we all fancy here actually? I didn't get who do, who do we fancy to get into the Division 1 final? K- Kerry and mm, I I, th- I think Tyrone will get in. I think Tyrone. You think goal, Tyrone, yeah. but then you maybe then... we might struggle against Monaghan. Right. Okay. Mm. That's interesting. Well, if, that's uh, an outside. I, I think Tyrone will be Galway, but I also think Ker- or Mayo will probably beat Monaghan. Monaghan have been struggling you now badly over the last couple of weeks, and you know that win in Kerry last week obviously will give Mayo. And look, I at, would see Mayo in it then with yeah, Kerry. There's a chance of, of Mayo getting to a league final, um, and it, you know, they're not going to turn down that chance. <laughs> Mayo are playing at home though. They don't like that. If they don't like <laughs> Castle Barrier, that's a disadvantage. So who are we fancy getting into the into the Division Two final then? Um, or who's going down from Division 1? So you both fancy Mayo to beat Monaghan, so that means... Mon- or, or Roscommon, you think, might lose to Kerry. Who do you think will go down? Is Cavan and Roscommon, which we tipped at the yeah. start. Yeah. So then Division 2 final, are we going me, Donegal? Yep. Yeah. Um, for for Mana, was it 58 points you have over six games? Like, that is serious bad shooting. Like, like yeah. Seamus Quig- or Sean Quigley has got like over a third of those scores as well. Like, so, so reliable. No, but they potentially could still probably beat me and still not get to the final. So, you know, yeah. they, they, they have the hardest route probably have of, the, the, yeah. of the four teams. So, yeah, no, they do. I saw Kieran McGee said afterwards, well, one of the selectors said, I was talking to Kieran in the dressing room afterwards, and he says, We out for Manad for Mana. <laughs> so, it was nice to see Armagh, who again, when you play for Manny, you have to completely change the script of how you like the game to play because that kicking game is just going to destroy you and it has happened with Armagh before. So it was nice to see Armagh having to cop on. Like, I mean, and Leash did it last year against Carlo, played a very possession-based hand-pass game, then went into the Leinster final against Dublin and played a, a much uh, more expensive, longer, expensive game. kicking game. So I can't understand how... Enough, imagine Armagh just going into a Fermanagh game saying, let's commit, well, we'll play our kick. Yeah. It doesn't work, lads. Yeah. See, I mean, Don't yeah. worry about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but that's an old school thing as well, though, Matty, isn't it? Well, we'll focus on our game yeah, here. Yeah, we'll right? be him doing what, rather than saying, look, at Jesus, maybe I have to change a little bit here because doing what we're doing against this particular team is just not going to work. Yeah. There's sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, you have to... It's like we're saying about Tyrone probably have two game plans and Dublin have... You, most teams probably do have now because you know, while we've kind of... Sound of the death knell of football over the last year, year and a half. In fairness, I think it's actually starting to go back to the other where, where more teams are trying to play football. And I think you see that during the National League with some of the score lines. Maybe for Manor, a bit of an exception, but I think actually, in fairness to them, with, with the with the selection or the numbers they have and the resources they have, I think they've done unbelievably well. I think along with Leitrim, they're probably they're probably two of the, the big stories of the of the National League this year. In fairness yeah. to them, now looking, they still might make Division One, but you know you can only kind of play with what you with what you have they're overachieving definitely so who's going to go down from division 2 then so like i mean fancy armagh to be cork yeah. at home lads like i mean armagh like we've covered armagh maybe disproportionately too much cuz i i like them um and i'm producing the show so like <laughs> <laughs> so like i mean we have then if armagh be cork cork are gone which is a huge embarrassment for cork football then we have tipperary clare that's in semple stadium so, like, I mean, Semple Stadium isn't a huge advantage to Tipperary because there's nobody is ever at them, yeah. like, which is a huge part of home advantage is having some support there. Now, they'll know the pitch a bit better, but uh, who do we fancy here? That'll determine who goes down. Claire will love that pitch as well. It's so open for them, like, yeah. in their fast forwards and the kicking games. Claire yeah. aren't a force they were last year, aren't they not? Like, I mean, they, they were winning games last year. Like, I mean... I don't know, home to Mead. I thought it was disappointing to go down that yeah. much. I was surprised at that because they're really hard to beat in, in Ennis. You're talking me back round now. <laughs> yeah, right, look, what I thought the start of the season, Clare would have been there, thereabouts, in with a shout of actually promotion. They've been ultra impressive over the last couple of years, uh, particularly in qualifiers in the championship. They've took some really big scalps you know, away from home. But, um, you know, it just hasn't happened for them this year. That can happen, you know, it's the same, kind of the same group of players and, you know, maybe a little bit of staleness, whatever, set in, but... 
you know that match with Tipperary I think could absolutely go anyway and maybe just because Tipperary are home you might give yeah and Quinn Livens back Quinn Livens back from he's back from injury he's he wasn't picked to start against Kildare but he but he started the game so like I mean that's you know that that's, in itself that's your, probably that's you know, it's just, just it's like the you know Croaks bringing on yeah. Luch, that in itself will give players around him a bit of uh, a bit of confidence as well and you know possibly just because they're home you might you might fancy Tip I'd lean towards Tip that would put Clare and Cork down um, yeah so that's it so Division 3 lads this is where it's all about for me anyways um, and every team like, like I said outside of Carlo or outside of Sligo have a chance so again there's one there's five teams in this division within a cha- in with a chance of winning the of getting into the final isn't the league brilliant like when you think about it in all those divisions there's only two teams to get to the final. So it's not like a top four. It's just a top two. And you're having four teams involved to get the, to get in. And you have three teams involved. And you've only won with dead rubber in the last game. Mm-hmm. Imagine if that was the championship. Because obviously scaremongering in the championship is like, well, the last league game. Like uh, my whole idea is that the league would be the championship. And then people say, would be saying, oh, well, the last two games then for some counties might mean nothing and it won't be championship. But my answer to that will be, well, the first five would be championship, yeah. which is more than they have now. Mm-hmm. And number two, based on this year's league, it's only Dublin, Armagh, Dublin, Armagh and Sligo, Sligo are the only three teams out of 12 that have nothing to play for on the last day. And the team they play will have something because Offaly play Sligo, Armagh play Cork and Dublin play... Oh, Dublin Cavan's the only dead duck of the whole of the whole, the whole three, yeah. uh, division. three divisions. three divisions, yeah. And obviously four, uh, the way that worked out, that... Uh, that wrapped up <laughs> two weeks ago yeah, so really that's play. probably you that's wouldn't have the league to enjoy at this time of the year though which is classic I, I love the league as well, well, you you could say, oh, well I'd start the league in March and I'd have a league game every two weeks and run it into the middle of June and then play all Ireland quarterfinals semi-finals and finals from the based out of your league uh, positions and that's your whole season done March straight through the end of July boom <laughs> <laughs> I think we're coming near the end of the show. I don't think we have enough time to sort no, this one out again no, today. Well, that, well done, actually. Well done for that call because that's exact, that was exactly what was going through my head. Okay, so we'll go through Division 3 quickly. So down is... Uh, down are pretty much true. They'll go up if they win or draw against Loud. Even if they lose to Loud, they'll go up if Westmead lose to Longford and Leash beat Carlo. Um, anyways, down are pretty much, pretty much up. Um, Leash is an interesting one. So a win against Carlo sends them up but only if Longford beat Westmead so Leash's big threat well Leash have two threats actually Loud and Westmead but obviously Loud play Westmead so they both can't be threats one of the two of them can be threats and they've both beaten Leash so they'll lose out to the head the head on both of them so they really need Longford to beat Westmead they'd like Down to beat Loud and get them out of there I think if Leash beat Carlo I think they'd be in with a good chance you know although I worry about Westmead beating Longford and Loud to pip them by a point I think it's between Leash and Longford um, Westmead then need to beat Longford and hope that either Down or Leash are beaten um, and you know that will if, if Westmead beat Longford if we, Westmead beat Longford they go above Leash and Leash are done so like that's if Leash lose then Longford are instead within, in with a shout so they need to beat Westmead they need Le- Leash to lose to Carlo just to stay into the mix and then Loud they have to beat Down Um a draw could keep them in it if Leash lose to if Leash lose and Westmead beat Longford. So there's a lot of it's it's a little bit more complicated in that division because there's an extra game to potentially come. It's not as clear cut, but I think it's between Down Leash and Westmead realistically. No, well, I'd be given one place to Down. I think straight away I'd, I'd fancy Down to beat probably Loud this weekend, particularly at home. You know, after a, a shaky enough start, you know, they yeah. had, had a very good league campaign, and there were one team we, we suppose we all would look at in Division Three possibly to go straight back up, and I I think they will. And then as you say, look at there's a there's a host of things that can happen. I, I I think this weekend that Westmead could possibly beat Longford, which might, um, you know, might make things a little bit clearer. Um, with that Westmead uh, loud game still to be played, and that probably will have to be played. I'd say to decide it. I think that will have to be played because I I find if Westmead beat Longford, they're on uh, and Leash beat Carlow. Westmead are a point behind Leash, and they obviously have that game in hand. But then they could lose that game in hand against Loud. But if Loud have lost against Down, I think if Leash beat Carlow. They'll well, have a good, they'll be on 10 points and they'll have a good yeah. chance of well, getting look, through. Well, look, you'd rather have the points in the bag and be hoping, or, or rather than kind of looking up at someone else trying to do you favours. I know they kind of still do need that to happen, but you be, if Leash go and win the game, you know, to give themselves a great chance, then if they lose the game, they'll have, have no chance. If Carlo lose to Leash and Offaly beat Sligo, uh, Carlo go down, which is incredible because I've mentioned this on Monday, looking from the outside, you think, geez, Carlo are competing really well in that league. Like apparently they were robbed against down 
with a refereeing decision against Westmead away they were robbed with a refereeing decision as well so there's two points um, which would see them completely comfortable you know potentially th- um, in the division you have Offaly who weren't haven't been as oppressive at all across the mm-hmm. across the whole thing have only beaten Carlo and now could beat uh, Sligo and finish above Carlo, which I think would be a slight injustice, but like that's the league table doesn't lie. No, look, I think Offaly were really a lucky the first day. I think it was away to Westmead or home to Westmead. I think they were way ahead at half time and ended up getting pipped by a point. Oh, that so, was it. And that was, know, yeah, that was a really, that was, oh, that was a last minute goal. Yeah. It was an OG, wasn't it? It something, was a terribly fluky thing. Like, yeah. They never looked like there was any result other than an Offaly win. And you know, had, they, had they got that, those two points you know I think they were probably pretty much safe now even before this last game with Sligo but um, you know look at it, the end of the end of the league the league table doesn't lie everyone knows they're going to have seven games and uh, you know it's up to yourself but like it probably will be a bit of a blow to Carlo to come in with huge momentum into this league campaign and a great start and now look it's all kind of fizzled away and they could, they yeah. could end up getting going oh, straight back to Division 4 It would be a huge kick in the arse to Carlo if the Carlo Rising sees them back and the celebrations of getting out of there and they've performed pretty well I think it would be a massive demoralising thing for that team and that management team. Yeah, and I think Leash would, would enjoy nothing more than to send them down Oh, we as would. Well. <laughs> oh, we would. Oh, we would. <laughs> so I, I think Leash will win, to be honest, and it's just up to Osley to do the business. But I, I think West Meath will, will win their two games. Like Jerry Egan and John Hessen are, like, you know, <laughs> they're going to shoot their, their way through these two well, games. We've Evan O'Carroll and Donny Kingston. I know you're going to win see, your game. I'll see your Egan and <laughs> no, Hesslin. You're going to win your game, but I think it might be um, too late then with West Meath, two games to come. And Does that mean then the Division 3 final has to be played on its own and the Division 4 final has to be played in Crow Park on its own? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I'd disaster. say the Division 4 final will have to go somewhere else. Which is uh, a nightmare d- because d- personally, like, I, like Derry have been in it for the last two weeks you know, in the final. Like, we have people coming down, you know, no one at the you. games in the they third could play of maybe the three of them on the Sunday if there was only three of them. Play a triple head, triple header. It'll probably be a triple mm-hmm. somewhere because they could end up playing it with the two hurling league finals either, but that's yeah. more than likely going to be in Turles, I'd yeah. say. So, but like, you know, the, the triple header probably on the Sunday yeah. is looking the most likely maybe yeah I, I, and I don't think they'll open Croke Park in fairness for a, a Division 4, four final yeah, yeah. And then they'll have to find a suitable halfway venue between Down and Leash for the Division 3 final right so we'll look forward to that um, when Leash are getting it that that, that did went b- over both of your heads but anyway, maybe you're just I didn't you, I think, I think maybe, <laughs> maybe you're just losing the will to live at this stage <laughs> right listen that's always time for we we'll back on Monday Keen Ward will be back in the mix I'm sure and we'll review the final day so there's loads to look forward to from on the show right talk to you then good luck